Hey everybody, welcome to this presentation of navigating the special education process and supporting students with special needs in the mainstream classroom. Now, before we really get started, um, I want you to just really think about the song I just played, We Are Family. And I want you to think how that may pertain to what we're gonna be talking about today when we talk about navigating the SPED process and supporting students with special needs in the mainstream classroom. We'll get back to that a little bit later, but just think, why did I select this song to start this presentation? <clears throat> anyway, again, I'm happy to be here um, and just find a comfortable place and, um, and let's get started. So before we really get into the meat of this presentation, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about who I am. Well, my name is Anton McCoy. Um, you can see that's me uh, on the slides. And um, I am a father to a 12-year-old middle school daughter, so help me, <laughs> um, new, new season of life. I'm a husband uh, to a beautiful wife. Um, I love music. Uh, Music is like the universal language to me. So whatever mood I'm in, I can find a song to help me get through it. Um, whether it's gospel, whether it's hip hop, R&B, jazz, I often have jazz Sundays, uh, even show tunes. Uh, I love all that. I'm from New York City, so I love Broadway. Uh, I love to dance, all types of dances, just from social dancing and all the way to ballroom dancing. Uh, and I love to learn new dances. Uh, and I love all things barbecue, all things barbecue. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. When I used to live in the South, uh, I used to love to get a lot of barbecue of everything. So I got kind of a little spoiled uh, now that I live in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but a little bit about my career in education. Uh, so this is my I'm 27th year in education. Um, I am a national board certified teacher. Uh, I've been a SPED teacher all my life, uh, but I've worked a lot in the general education classroom and with gen ed teachers. Uh, like I said, originally I'm from New York City, but I've taught in New York City. I've taught in Northern Alabama, and now uh, I'm living in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon, and I've taught here as well. Uh, I've taught all grades, K-12, and after leaving the classroom for 18 years, uh, I moved into a role as an instructional mentor coach for new teachers, uh, specifically special education teachers in their first three years, but I've also worked with a lot of gen ed teachers along the way as well. I do a lot of staff development and PD training, um, particularly for new teachers and just around how to support students with special needs and uh, in the classroom, and I'm an educational consultant. And so I consult with uh, schools, colleges, uh, service districts, educational organizations, just to help improve uh, and have a better impact in education. So that's a little bit about me uh, <clears throat> and my background. Uh, I love what I do, and I'm really happy to be here. So, Let's look a bit at our agenda for today. So today we're gonna to talk about a bunch of things. I'm kinda of gonna give you a high level view of, of a lot of different things that you can take with you into your teaching practice. Some things might be applicable right away. Some might not be applicable at this time, but I wanna give you a, a broad range of, of information and strategies and techniques you can use um, in your classroom. So we're gonna look at our learning objectives. We're gonna then look at an overview of the SPED process. We're gonna look at the role of the gen ed teacher in the SPED process, which is extremely important. Uh, sometimes people, uh, I've heard teachers say they don't feel that important in the process, but you're a critical member of the team. Then we're gonna to move to looking at best practices uh, with gen ed and SPED uh, teachers in terms of collaboration, because that's a, extremely important part of supporting students um, with special needs in, in the mainstream classroom. And then we'll kind of close it all out um, <clears throat> as we go along. 
So let's look at our learning objectives. Uh, by the end of this, I would hope these three things you could come away with. So one, I will be able to understand the special education process and my role as a teacher within it. Next, I will understand the important sections of the IEP, your responsibilities at the IEP meetings, and how to support students with special needs in the classroom. And then finally, I will learn best practices to collaborate with SPED teachers and other support staff to meet the needs of students with disabilities in my classroom. Like I said earlier, uh, I said, come and get comfortable. Uh, I would, if you could have a notebook or a journal by you, that would be great for you so you can take notes. Not only that, you might not want, you not only taking notes, but um, I'm gonna have some places within this presentation where we're gonna take some pauses and I'm gonna have you reflect um, on some of the material that we've discussed because it's one thing to get a lot of material, uh, but it's another thing to, to think about in terms of your own practice and how you might use it. So I really want this to be as interactive as, as possible, um, even though we're, we're doing this virtually. And just come with an open mind. Some of you come with a lot of experience maybe in the SPED world and, and working with students with special needs and, and in your classroom and understanding the process. Some maybe it might be totally brand new um, which for a lot of you, it, it probably is. And so I just want you to come with an open mind, ready to learn, ready to gather some tools for your toolbox, as I always tell the, the, the new teachers I work with. After we work together, I just hope that you have some more tools you can put in your toolbox to help you in your teaching practice. So with that said, uh, let's move on to the next section. So. Um, before we move into that section, I want you to pause and reflect. Take about two minutes and in your journal and notebook, jot down your understanding of how a student becomes eligible for special education support services. From your knowledge, how do you see them becoming eligible for special, for special ed services? Um, <clears throat> because this is the first part we're gonna talk about uh, because you're an important part of that process. So what I would do now is just uh, pause the video, pause the presentation, and get answer this question, and then come back to it afterwards. So welcome back. I hope you had a chance to just jot down some notes and just you know brainstorm just your understanding of of. Uh, how a student becomes eligible for special education services, uh, where you're at. So before I get in and talk about that, that, that process, and we're going to talk about it in different stages, I want to use an example from or an analogy from the medical community to help you really understand how this process works, the SPED process works. And I want you to think about it in terms of short-term versus long-term educational care. So let's look at this example. So let's look at the example of treating a migraine headache. So let's say, for instance, you had a migraine headache, uh, really hurting you bad. Some of us actually have them. And so you might know more about the different um, things you do to kind of help it. But when you have a headache, what are some of the first things you may do? Well, you first may go get some water because you may be dehydrated. I know that's one thing. I, the first thing I do is always drink some water, just make sure I'm, not, I'm hydrated. Or you may eat or sleep just be, to, to, to see if it'll wear off. Um, if that doesn't work, you may take like some over-the-counter medicine like ibuprofen or, or an aspirin or things of that sort. But let's say for instance, hopefully it'll work and the headache will go away and you can continue on and be successful day to day. But let's say for instance, it continues over a period of time 
and the things you've been trying, the water, the, the medicine, you know, the, I, the, the aspirin, things like that doesn't work, then you may go to your doctor and they may give you a referral for a specialist. So you may go see a neurologist and you get a referral for a neurologist and they may do some further tests like an MRI, a CAT scan, whatever they may do, just to see what may be further causing the headache. And I, I use this example because it's very similar in a sense, not the same, but similar in terms of how we look at the SPED process, um, uh, how a student becomes eligible for SPED, for SPED uh, special education services. You wouldn't necessarily automatically go to a specialist. You would try a lot of interventions before that. And that's similar to how the SPED process is gonna work. So let's look right here. So let's say you have some students in your classes and they may struggle, right? So before we even move into the process, you, you may notice students who may be struggling in different areas, academically, um, maybe math, reading or writing, maybe there's some behavioral issues, some social skills and in, 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 in relating to other students and grade level peers, or maybe there's some communication issues, social communication issues or, or, or speech. You know, there's some, maybe some speech issues, or there might be even some attentional issues. What you're finding here is that you're noticing that this is some areas of struggle that the student may have. So, what are some things we can do? We'll think about just like the, 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 the aspirin and the, the headache example, and we try these interventions. You want to implement specific targeted interventions to identify students to give additional support in areas they may be struggling. And so for instance, if a student is struggling in the area of reading, you may do some more targeted interventions to see whether or not the student responds to those interventions and makes progress. Uh, it's the same thing with math. You may do some uh, specific targeted interventions for math and or writing to see how the student may actually respond to those interventions. And so you can use your team, you can use the, the resources that you have at your school or in your district um, to see what happens. Because sometimes, many times, students just need a little extra support and that extra support is what's gonna help them to be successful in the class. And oftentimes that does work. Uh, and I just put right here a resource for you. Um, it's, uh, it's called interventioncentral.org. And it's just a, a, a site that just has a lot of different types of academic and behavioral interventions that could be helpful for a student. So if you're ever looking for something um, and you can't find something in your district or in your school, uh, here's a resource that you may look at that could be really helpful for you. But, While you're doing these interventions, targeted interventions in different areas, what you want to do is you want to document the student progress to see are they responding in a positive, like is it working or it isn't. So data is important in the process. Um, and then after a certain amount of time, a certain amount of weeks, um, depending on what you do in your district or your school, um, you decide whether to continue the interventions, like if the interventions are working, then you wanna continue them, or you may decide, you know what? We're trying all these different interventions, we're giving a little bit of time, and when we monitor the progress, they're not making any um, significant progress and they're still falling behind. <clears throat> so when that happens, then that's the time where you might make a referral for additional testing to determine if a student may have a disability and needs special education support services. And I say that because uh, oftentimes we rush to do additional testing, but just like we wouldn't rush to go see a specialist when we have a headache, we wanna try the interventions first, see how you respond to it, and see how a student responds to these interventions, behaviorally, into the behavior interventions and academic interventions. And then from that point, we want to say, okay, 
they're not responding. So let's refer for additional testing and get permission to test to see if we can find out something else that's there. And that may be helpful to help the student move along. Now, that's from a teacher's perspective. But I say, I say that, that it's important to try these other things first, because just because the student is behind doesn't mean that they have a disability. That's different. And so you can be behind and need some support, but we want to make sure that when we are actually making referrals, that they're good referrals. Okay. So in one part, that's kind of the school and a, a teacher can do it. A counselor can do it. Um, the school system can do it. But then also a parent may see that this student has a um, specific need and the parent may say, you know what? Yeah. Um, my students really, I mean, my, my, my son or daughter is really struggling in these areas <clears throat> and they, <clears throat> they can make a request for additional testing to see if their student qualifies for, for services. So you have the teacher request referral and you also have a parent referral. I specifically wanted to talk a little bit about how um, your role in the referral process is because trying those targeted interventions are important before moving to the next step for referring. So let's say you try targeted interventions, you've given some time to monitor the progress, and we see that it's not working. Well, what can we do then? Well, <clears throat> a student can start to be evaluated for, uh, for additional testing and to see if they qualify for additional services. Uh, so during the SPED process, now the, the parent has signed permission for testing to happen, um, then you're going to have psychologists, other people doing testing, uh, maybe re uh, related service providers coming in that are there here to really help to see um, whether or not the how the student does um, on these specific uh, tests. And then they're going to meet together and then um, have an initial uh, evaluation meeting. And at that time, they'll go over the testing, and the testing is going to show whether or not, yeah, there may be, there's a disability, there's um, in needing special education services, or they'll find that, no, they don't meet the qualifications for it, and there's no special education services needed. Um, <clears throat> and then that, at that point, then an initial individual, um, individualized education program is developed, or as we know it as the IEP, um, and placement for the students determined. And that, make it, that determines a lot of times that placement is in the general education classroom with some resource or support services from the special ed teacher because um, the law says you want to be um, educated in the least restrictive environment and that's as close to the general education classroom as possible and then bring in extra resources support at that time. <clears throat> so knowing that this is happening during the process, what is the role of the general education teacher throughout that process? So here's a couple of things. One, you want to continue doing those targeted interventions that you were doing before the process started, even though the student wasn't responding to those interventions. Um, you want to continue to still do them and, and monitor the progress and give that, that information to the SPED teacher and, and to the team so that they can just continue to monitor it over time. Um, you want to fill out any forms or information requested as part of the referral process. Uh, so sometimes you might get information that, um, that you have to fill out um, from your perspective as a, a classroom teacher, and you want to fill that out um, as complete as possible. You might not know everything. And then you want to return the forms in a timely manner. Generally, during the, the, the SPED process, there's a certain amount of time that everything has to be done before that initial evaluation happens. And uh, the sooner and the faster that, that information can get into the team, um, the people who are actually evalu doing evaluations, the faster the process can move along. So that's during the process. So we talked about before and during the process. Now let's talk about, uh, after the process. So let's say that student is evaluated, 
they have an initial eligibility meeting, they qualify for services, for special education support services. What is that process look like afterwards? Well, now they have an IEP. And so now they can get additional services. And a lot of times they're, they're st uh, those students will still be in the mainstream classroom. So I'm gonna touch on these really quick and then we're gonna actually go a little bit more in depth into um, your roles and responsibilities with, along with these. So after the process, a student has an initial IEP meeting, they have an IEP, um, you want to attend the IEP meetings for the students. <clears throat> There's usually an annual review that happens, but sometimes there are amendments that happen in, in meetings in between. You want to attend those IEP meetings um, so you can give your input because you are a part of the team and the gen ed teacher is required to be a part of that IEP team along with a parent, a special ed teacher, a district rep, and then, and, and, and then any other people invited to the meeting. But the gen ed teacher is a key required member of that team. Next, you want to implement accommodations and modifications that may come from that meeting into your classroom. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. And then you wanna collaborate with your SPED teacher to support staff and parents along the way um, to help support those students in your class. So those are the three, three big things after a student becomes eligible for special education services and they have an IEP. So we're gonna do another quick reflection. And so what I want you to do is um, in your notebook or journal, reflect on the following. <clears throat> so think about your classroom and where you're at right now in the school year, whatever you're, whenever you're listening to this. And I want you to do three things. One, identify any students that are in the pre-referral SPED process. So that's like before they're being referred for SPED, um, and you, you, you know that there's some need, there's some challenges, and they're kind of on the radar that may need some targeted interventions. Who are those students in your classroom? Just jot that down. Then think about students who are currently in the initial evaluation process. That means um, they were referred, um, permission was given to do additional testing, and they're in that process. They don't yet have an IEP, um, because um, they're still in the testing phase, but uh, they're in the, 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 the process, the during process. And then let's think about how many of your students have you already, have already been identified or receiving special education support services. And so they have an IEP and they're in your class and you're servicing them as well. So pause this, take about two minutes or more to reflect and then we'll come back uh, afterwards. Okay, so after you jotted that down, I had you jotted down just so you can have an idea of where students are at the pro in the process, because that'll let you know kind of what your role is and how you can help be the supportive in that process <clears throat> as a member of the team. So now, you've been invited to IEP meetings for students in your class. And so what are some of your responsibilities at, um, at, at these IEP meetings? Well, first and foremost, it seems kind of obvious, but attend the IEP meetings. And here's the thing, I know you are busy and you have a lot of responsibilities, um, but attending those meetings are really important because you're a crucial member of the team. And so uh, first and foremost, attend the meetings. Uh, Second, uh, a key part of that meeting is gonna be concerns that the parents may have. And I always say, listen to parent concerns. I, oftentimes, um, we may have some concerns that we wanna address um, at the meeting and parents have some concerns as well. Oftentimes they do correspond to each other, but oftentimes parents might have some concerns that we never really th thought about. And I always say that this is probably one of the most important parts of the meeting when I used to run uh, my own meetings as a, a, a special ed case manager. And because I could have a parent, I could run a great IEP meeting, I could go through all the different sections, but if a parent concern wasn't addressed, 
um, they would leave the meeting maybe dissatisfied. And I realized that they don't always need, uh, you might not always be able to answer their questions or give them what they need at that moment. However, what you can do is they want to feel heard. So listening to parent concerns helps them feel heard. So that's a key part of the meeting, um, listening to the concerns. Um, you want to share student strengths. Students are in this class and they might struggle in many areas, but they 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 have strengths. Um, and sometimes it's not always in academic areas. It can be they're, 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 they have social strengths and things like that. So really think about how you can share that and add that piece to the, to the conversation at the IEP. Then you wanna discuss students' areas of needs, which you may know, um, but you're gonna come at it from a different perspective than like the, spe the special ed teacher and other people um, in the meeting. So your, your strengths and concerns when areas of, of need are important. Uh, you wanna share present levels of students like academically, how they're doing academically, reading, writing, math, socially, behaviorally. Um, I say, and it's important if you can, and when appropriate, bring in examples of student work, particularly sometimes like in areas of writing, you can talk about writing, but when you actually see a sample of student writing or, or what they can actually do, it really says a lot more by showing some evidence. And then as you go through the process of go through the meeting, um, the special education teacher will talk about goals that they may need to work on in areas of need. Um, and they might be in different areas. And then they'll talk about accommodations, which we're gonna talk about a little bit more in, in a second. And so the important part of that is that you give your input on that. <clears throat> um, you give your input in any of those areas as part of the team when you can. So let's say that you, um, that's being in, in a meeting, but let's say you have, kid, you, you have students in your class now who have IEPs um, and you, you, you're looking at some of the IEPs that they have or you have access to it. Um, I would say there are many parts of that document and that program that's um, important but I would say, if I would say to pinpoint key sections of it for you to review, especially um, at the beginning or when you get a new student or, or, or things of that sort, um, these are the four sections. One, looking at the cover page, somewhere there's gonna give you the disability category. So, so they might have a specific learning disability. They could uh, be a, a student with had, um, autism spectrum disorder. They might have, uh, communication disorder where they, you know, where speech is important um, and they might have a speech and language pathologist involved in that. Um, or they might have a other health impairment, which, which, which may be different things, but sometimes it, a student might have um, ADD or ADHD. And so that kind of gives you an idea about like where, what um, areas students may be struggling in. Um, look at the present levels, because it's going to give you a little bit about how the student has been doing coming into your classroom, um, looking at some of the annual goals, um, so you know what areas that they, they really are struggling in. And then I highlight it right here, the accommodations and modification, because this is the key part of what you need to implement in your gen ed class, in the mainstream classroom, to help students be successful. And we're gonna talk about this in a second. What, you mean they're not the same? One of the biggest questions I always get and where there's confusion is in this area of accommodations and modifications. What they are, are they, you know, are they the same? How are they different? And it's really important to understand the, the, the difference between the two um, because uh, if you're responsible for implementing them in a general education classroom, then it's important to understand how they're, how they're different and how you can actually implement them. So just gonna do, I can do a training just on this alone, but for now, we're just gonna kind of do a, a quick overview. So let's look at accommodations. So accommodations change how a student learns the material in the classroom. Um, it does not reduce the learning or performance expectations of what the student is learning. So for instance, the student is still expected to do 
the grade level work. It just changes how the student will learn it. So for instance, <clears throat> um, an accommodation may be listening to an audio book or having the book read aloud if a student has some decoding issues, but they're still going to answer the same comprehension questions as the rest of the class. So they understand the comprehension and they're trying to, and you're still not changing that, that grade level expectation. However, listening to the book versus actually reading the text will actually um, help them to be able to, 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 to answer those comprehension questions. So that's an example of something. Another example might be, for instance, you may be doing um, something in math and the class has to do 20 problems to, 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 to see if they can master this um, standard. Well, a student who maybe have more processing um, issues or maybe a lot slower in doing stuff, well, instead of giving them 20, you may give them 10. You know, sometimes I would tell students, you just do the odds or the evens. So they might just do two of 10 of the problems. The difference is they still have to show whether they understand the material at that level. They just don't have to do 20 problems. I can tell whether a student understands something doing 20 problems or doing 10 based on how they do with it. So that would be an example of an accommodation. Modifications, um, well, a modification changes what a student is taught or expected to learn. Students far behind their peers academically may need changes to the curriculum and are not expected to learn the same material as their grade level peers. So for instance, a grade level peers might be learning how to solve like two digit multiplication problems. That's the standard they're working on in the grade, a, a grade level. But a student that has modifications in that class may be learning addition facts because they're so below grade level that they can't access doing multiplication at that time. So they're working on addition facts. So it's changing what a student is learning um, and it's not at the same level. To get a little more specific, um, <clears throat> some general accommodations or more examples might be um, extended time to complete assignments, frequent checks for understanding, preferential seating, hard copies of notes, or tests taken in a separate location or setting. But when you look at a modification, it could be a completely different homework, different homework problems than their peers. They might be answering different test questions, or you might create an alternative project, an alternate project or assignment for them to do because they can't do what their grade level pairs are doing. So let's take a quick activity to see whether or not you'll be able to figure this out, see if you know the difference between accommodations and modifications. So Fatima has an intellectual disability. She joins a regular education classroom for group activities, science, social studies, centers, and breaks. When it's time for math, Fatima goes with the special education teacher to work one-on-one -on -one with basic foundational math skills. This is while the rest of the class learns fractions. That would be a what? That would be a modification because Fatima is working on a completely different math curriculum with unique expectations. So let's look at another example. So Trey is, a re is in reading intervention as he is a year below grade level. He has been making good progress in his intervention class though. During the same reading unit, the teacher gives Trey a shortened version of the class text. So he does not fatigue while reading the grade level assignment. That would be, it will be an accommodation because he is still expected to read the same grade level material, just shortened a bit. So we're going to pause and reflect right now. And if you can, find a copy of an IEP of a student in your class or one from a special education teacher that you may work with. I want you to locate the accommodations and or modifications section of the IEP. And then I want you to think about how might, for that particular student, um, those accommodations and modifications be implemented in your own classroom. OK, take two minutes and we'll come back in a minute and after that. Okay, we are moving on to our last section. And um, we're gonna look at the best gen ed sped collaborative practices because 
this is how we really can get into serving students um, with special needs in our classrooms uh, because it's really a collaborative process. It goes back to the song that I started with, We Are Family, like it's a team effort. And so the number one collaborative uh, practice is really having regular communication. I know uh, gen ed teachers are busy, sped teachers are busy, everyone is busy, but really finding the time to come together and talk about students, specifically students um, in your classroom who have IEPs, is gonna be the most beneficial part of helping to support them. I said like, here, it's not about, it's all about having a team approach. It's not your kids, but it's our kids. And how with different ways that we can do that. Having in-person meetings weekly or monthly, um, emailing each other um, pretty weekly or daily, depending on who, this, who the student is. And even sometimes just using a Google Drive where you can just share information, progress and things like that with each other if you can't meet in person or, or things of that sort. These are all things that we I found to be effective over the years in terms of having some regular type of communication between special ed and the gen ed teachers um, around helping to support students uh, with special needs in your classroom. Um, collaborative practice number two um, is co-planning instruction. So you might not always be able to do this, but sometimes if you can, you can design lessons together. And if that's not possible, at least discuss how to modify instructional material and implement them um, accommodations in a classroom. We talked about accommodations and modifications. Sometimes it's like, well, how do I do this in my class? Talking together, um, a special edu education teacher can help you figure that out within your classroom and what you're doing. Um, also, when you come together and do some co-planning, you can differentiate instruction um, by adapting materials, technology, maybe even use assistive technology. I know sometimes a kid may just go to who can use speech to text, like in Google Docs, and they can speak out what they want to share if writing is an issue for them. So that might be a way of differentiating and using some assistive technology to help with that. And then also it just makes content accessible and inclusive. That's uh, Gen Ed SPED collaborative practice number three, co-teaching. There's a lot of inclusion going on in some places, um, not all places, but um, if you are co-teaching and you have a Gen Ed teacher um, and a SPED teacher in the same classroom, what allows you to do co-teaching is great because it allows you to share responsibility when delivering instruction. You can choose different models that fit the needs of the students in your classroom. Um, and there's many different models. I'll just, in, I'll talk about four right here. You can have a team teaching approach where you're both up there and you're just sharing the responsibilities at the front of the classroom. Um, you can have one, this is the one that I see happen the most. Um, and I use the most when I was in the classroom. One teaches and one assists. Um, and so one is at the front and the other person is helping to support uh, the students um, as they're doing the work. You can have station teaching where like one teacher is teaching one topic and another teacher is teaching another topic and then students rotate and then you can just have parallel teaching where you just kind of split them in small groups and you're both doing the same thing but in smaller groups but you're teaching the same content so co-teaching is very powerful with, with students as well um, collaborative practice number four uh, just working with support staff a lot of places you may have paraprofessionals or like instructional assistants or related service providers like the speech and language pathologist, an occupational therapy or a physical therapist. And they all have different expertise that they can bring to the class and help support the students in the classroom. And so utilizing them and being able to collaborate with them is also important. So realize who they are and you can a lot of times find out if they have a related, related service provider on their IEP. And then finally, we said this earlier, but parents are key members of the team, the IEP team. So parents and guardians um, getting their input and working with them to increase the success of students, um, this, of their student, of their child, really, um, will be extremely important. So when we look at this, I want you to take two minutes 
And based upon the, the collaborative practices that we just talked about, which ones are easiest for you to incorporate into your teaching? Which ones pose the greatest challenge? And maybe one is one small step you can make to address one of the challenge areas. So think about that of those five collaborative practices we talked about, um, I just talked about, and see which one of those answer these questions based on that. I'll come back in two minutes. All right, we're in a home stretch right now. So uh, we went through the, the process. Um, we went through responsibilities and we talked about collaboration. So in closing, do you have a better understanding of the special education process and your role as a teacher within it? I want you to just ponder these questions. Do you understand your role at IEP meetings, the different sections of the IEP, and the difference between accommodations and modifications a little better? And can you identify different ways to collaborate with SPED teachers and other support staff to meet the needs of um, excess, exceptional children in your classroom? Because that was the goal of this um, presentation is to, to really just pinpoint these key areas in terms of addressing um, how to support students with special needs in your classroom. And a lot of it has to do with that collaboration together because everybody comes with a certain amount of expertise and you have a key role as a part of the team. <clears throat> so I want to thank you for um, your time, doing some of the activities, and just really just opening your mind to just um, the process, what your role is going to be in helping support students with special needs in your classroom, and just the, the value of collaboration because you can't do it alone. And the, the, issue, the, the thing is, you are busy, you have a lot to do. And so there's, there's more to do and never enough time. But together as a team, we can support the needs of all students, specifically including students <clears throat> with um, exceptional um, needs in the classroom. So I just want to thank you. I want to leave you with this, um, it's called the You Matter Manifesto because um, your work and everything you do, do, do everything you do matters. Um, this is from Angela Myers. She calls it the You Matter Manifesto. And it says, you are enough. You have influence. You are a genius. You have a contribution to make. You have a gift that others need. You are the change. Your actions define your impact you matter and you matter to our students and so keep up the great work uh, when you don't know something ask questions and more importantly collaborate and continue to grow i hope this added some new tools into your toolbox to help you as you move forward in this year um, but your work matters so thank you very much and if you want to uh, stay in contact, you know, with the work that I do, uh, I have a, uh, Inspiration Education Unlimited is a, a company and uh, where I do a lot of my consulting and work with teachers and have resources. And if you just scan the, the barcode here, it'll take you to a site, my link tree, that has uh, my website. Um, it also has some free uh, resources. I think one is a, a new teacher checklist that's on there too um, uh, to help you um, in the, the, the first years of teaching. Uh, and so you can connect with me there. And like I said, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure. And like I said, keep doing what you do. We appreciate you. And I'm gonna take it out from here. <laughs>